Ranger's Apprentice, Book 1, The Ruins of Gorlan, by John Flanagan. Chapter 4 Well, well who? Martin asked in aspiration, flicking through the sheets of paper with the candidate's detail written on them. He had only been the Baron's secretary for five years, and so knew nothing of Will's history. He realized now that there was no family name on the boy's papers, and assuming that he had made a mistake, he was annoyed at himself. What's your family name, boy? he asked severely. Will looked at him, hesitating, hating this moment. I, I don't have, uh, he began, but mercifully, the Baron interceded. Will is a special case, Martin, he said quietly. His look telling the secretary to let the matter go. He turned back to Will, smiling encouragement. What school did you wish to apply for, Will? Battle school, my, my lord, Will replied, trying to sound confident in his voice. The Baron allowed a frown to crease his forehead, and Will felt his hope sinking. Battle school, Will, you don't think you are a little on the small side? The Baron asked gently. Will bit his lip. He had all but convinced himself that if he wanted this badly enough, if he believed in himself strongly enough, he would be accepted, in spite of his obvious shortcomings. I haven't had my growing spurt yet, sir, he said desperately. Everybody says that. The Baron rubbed his bearded chin with thumb and forefinger as he considered the boy before him. He glanced to his battle master. Rodney, he said. The tall knight stepped forward, studied Wolf for a moment or two, and slowly shook his head. I'm afraid he's too small, my lord. Will felt a cold hand clutch his heart. I'm stronger than I look, sir, he said. But the battle master was unswayed by the plea. He glanced at the baron, obviously not enjoying the situation, and shook his head. Any second choice, Will? the baron asked. His voice was gentle even concerned. Will hesitated for a long moment. He had never considered any other selection. Horse school, sir? he asked finally. Horse school trained and cared for the mighty battle horses that the castle's knights rode. It was at least a link to battle school, Will thought. But Ulf, the horse master, was shaking his head already, even before the baron asked of his opinion. I need apprentices, my lord, he said, but this one's too small. He'd never control one of my battle horses. They stump him until the ground as soon as they look at him. Will could only see the burn through a watery blur now. He fought desperately to keep the tears from sliding down his cheeks. That would be the ultimate humiliation. To be rejected from battle school and then break down and cry in front of the Baron and all the craftmasters and his ward mates. What skills do you have, Will? The Baron was asking him. Will racked his brain. He wasn't good at lessons and languages as Alice was. He couldn't form neat perfect letters the way George did, nor did he have Jenny's interest in cooking. And he certainly didn't have Horace's muscle and strength. I'm a good climber, sir, he said, finally seeing that the Baron was waiting for him to say something. It was a mistake, he realized instantly. Chop the cook glared him angrily. He can climb all right. I remember when he climbed up and drained pipe into my kitchen and stole a tray of sweet cakes that were cooling on the windowsill. Will's job with the unfairness of it all. That had been two years ago. He was a child then, and it was a mere childish prank, he wanted to say. But now the scribe master was talking too. And just this last spring, he climbed up to our third floor store study and turned two rabbits loose doing our legal debates. Most disruptive, absolutely. Rabbits, you say, scribe master, said the baron, and Nigel nodded empathically. A male and a female rabbit, my lord, if you take my meaning, he replied. Most disruptive, indeed. Unseen by Will, the very serious Lady Pauline put one elegant hand in front of her mouth. She might have been concealing a yawn, but when she removed the hand, the corners of her mouth were slightly uptilted still. Well, yes, said the Baron, we all know how rabbits are. And as I said, my lord, it was in spring, Nigel went on, in case the Baron had missed the point. 
Lady Pauline gave a very unladylike cough. The Baron looked in her direction in some surprise. I think we get the picture, scribe master, he said, then returned his gaze to the desperate figure which stood in front of him. Will kept his chin up and stared straight ahead. The Baron felt for the young lad in that moment. He could see the tears welling up in those lively brown eyes, held back only by an infinite determination. Willpower, he thought abstractly, recognizing the play on the boy's name. He didn't enjoy putting the boy through all of this, but it had to be done. He sighed inwardly. Is there any one of you who could use this boy, he said. Despite himself, Will allowed his head to turn and gaze pleadingly at the line of craftmasters, praying that one of them would relent and accept him. One by one, silently they shook their heads. Surprisingly, it was the ranger who broke the awful silence in the room. There is something you should know about this boy, my lord, he said. Will had never heard Holt speak before. His voice was deep and soft-spoken, with the slightest spur of a Hibernian accent still noticeable. He stepped forward now and handed the Baron a sheet of paper, folded double. Harold unfolded it, studied the words written there, and frowned. You sure about this, Holt? he said. Indeed, my lord. The Baron carefully refolded the paper and placed it on his desk. He drummed his fingers thoughtfully on the desktop, then said, I'll have to think on this overnight. Hall nodded and stepped back, seeming to fade into the background as he did so. Will stared anxiously at him, wondering what information the mysterious figure had passed on to the Baron. Like most people, Will had grown up believing that the rangers were people who were best avoided. They were a secretive, arcane group, shrouded in mystery and uncertainty, and that uncertainty led to fear. Will didn't like the thought that Hall knew something about him, something that he felt was important enough to bring to the Baron's attention, today of all days. The sheet of paper lay there, tantalizingly close, yet impossibly far away. He realized that there was movement around him, and the Baron was speaking to the other people in the class. Congratulations to those, uh, those who were selected here today. It's a big day for all of you. So you're free to have the rest of the day off and enjoy yourself. The kitchens will provide a banquet for you in your quarters, and for the rest of the day, you have free run of the castle and the village. Tomorrow, you'll report to your new craftmaster's first thing in the morning. And if you'll take a tip from me, you'll make sure to be on time. He smiled at the other four, then addressed Will with a hint of sympathy in his voice. Will, I'll let you know tomorrow what I've decided about you. He turned to Martin and gestured for him to show the new apprentices out. Thank you everyone, he said, and left the room through the door behind his desk. The craftmasters followed his lead, then Martin ushered the former wards to the door. They chatted together excitedly, relieved and delighted that they had been selected by the craftmasters of their choice. Will hung back behind the others, hesitating as he passed the desk where the sheet of paper still lay. He stared at it for a moment, as if somehow he could see through the, into the words written on the reverse side. Then he felt the same sensation that he had felt earlier, that someone was watching him. He looked up and found himself staring into the dark eyes of the ranger who remained behind the parent's high back chair almost invisible in the strange cloak of his. Will shuddered in sudden frisson of fear and hurried out the room. Chapter 5 It was long after midnight. The flickering torches around the castle yard, already replaced once, had begun to burn low again. Will had watched patiently for hours, waiting for this moment when the lights were uncertain and the guards were yawning in the last hour of their shift. The day had been one of the worst he could remember. While his yearmates celebrated enjoying their feast and then spending their time in light-hearted horseplay through the castle and the village, Will had slipped away to the silence of the forest, a kilometer or so from the castle. There, in the dim green coolness beneath the trees, 
He had spent the afternoon reflecting bitterly on the events of the choosing, nursing the deep pain of disappointment and wondering what the ranger's paper had said. As the long day wore on and the shadows began to lengthen in the open fields beside the forest, he came to a decision. He had to know what was on the paper, and he had to know tonight. Once night fell, he made his way back to the castle, avoiding villagers and castle folk alike, and secreted himself in the branches of the fig tree again. On the way, he slipped unnoticed into the kitchens and helped himself to bread, cheese and apples. He munched moodily on these, barely tasting them as the evening passed and the castle began to settle down for the night. He observed the movements of the guards, getting a feeling for their timing as they went on their regular rounds. In addition to the guard troops, there was a sergeant on duty at the doorway of the tower that led to Baron Errol's quarters, but he was overweight and sleepy, and there was a little chance that he would pose a risk to Will. After all, he had no intention of using the door of the old stairway. Over the years, his insatiable curiosity and a penchant for going places where he wasn't supposed to had developed within him the skill of moving across seemingly open space without being seen. As the wind stirred the hour branches of the trees, they created moving patterns in the moonlight. Patterns that will now use to great effect. Instincts matched in his movement to the rhythm of the trees, blending easily into the pattern of the yard, becoming part of it and so being concealed by it. In a way, the lack of obvious cover made his task a little easier. The fat sergeant didn't expect anyone to be moving across the open space of the yard, so not expecting to see anyone, he failed to do so. Breathless, Will flattened himself against the rough stone of the tower wall. The sergeant was barely five meters away, and Will could hear his heavy breathing. But a small buttress in the wall hid him from the man's sight. He studied the wall in front of him, craning back to look up. The baron's office window was a long way up and further around the tower. To reach it, he would have to climb up, then work his way across the face of the wall to a spot beyond the point where the sergeant stood guard, then up again to the window. He licked his lip nervously. Unlike the smooth inner walls of the tower, the huge blocks of stone that comprised the tower's outer wall had a large gap between them. Climbing would be no problem. He'd have plenty of food and handholds all the way up. In some places, the stone would have been worn smooth by the weather over the years. He knew he'd have to be careful. But he'd climbed all of the other three towers at some point in the past, and he expected no real difficulty with this one. But this time, if he were seen, he wouldn't be able to pass it off as a prank. He would be climbing in the middle of the night to a part of the castle where he had no right to be. After all, the Baron didn't post guards on this tower for the fun of it. People were supposed to stay away unless they had business here. He rubbed his hands together nervously. What could they do to him? He had already been passed over in the choosing. Nobody wanted him. He was condemned to a life in the fields already. What could be worse than that? There was a nagging doubt at the back of his mind. He wasn't absolutely sure that he was a condemned to that life. A faint spark of hope still remained. Perhaps the Baron would relent. Perhaps if Will pleaded with him in the morning and explained about his father and how important it was for him to be accepted for battle school. There was a very faint chance that his wish would be granted, and then once he was accepted, he could show how his eagerness and dedication would make him a worthy student, until his going spurred happened. On the other hand, if he were caught in the next few minutes, not even the small chance would remain. He had no idea what they would do to him if he were caught, but he could be reasonably sure that it wouldn't involve being accepted into battle school. He hesitated, needing some extra slight push to get him going. It was the fat sergeant who provided it. Will heard the heavy intake of bread, the shuffling of the man's studded boots against the flagstones as he gathered his equipment together, and realized that the sergeant was about to make one of his irregular circuits of his beat. Usually this entailed going a few meters around the tower to either side of the doorway, then returning to his original position. 
It was more for the purpose of staying awake than anything else, but Will realized that it would bring them face to face within the next few seconds if he didn't do something. Quickly, easily, he began to swarm up the wall. He made the first five meters in a matter of seconds, spread out against the rough stone like a giant four-legged spider. Then hearing the heavy footstep directly below him, he froze, clinging to the wall in case some slight noise might alert the sentry. In fact, it seems that the sergeant had heard something. He paused directly below the pond where Will clung, peering into the night, trying to see past the dappled moving shadows cast by the moon and the swaying trees. But as Will had thought the night before, he will seldom look up. The sergeant, eventually satisfied that he had heard nothing significant, continued to march slowly around the tower. That was the chance Will needed. They also gave him the opportunity to move across the tower so that he was directly below the window he wanted. Hands and feet finding perches easily. He moved almost as fast as a man could walk, all the time going higher up and higher up the wall. At one point he looked down, and that was a mistake. Despite his good head for heights, his vision swam slightly as so how far he had become and how far below him the hard flagstones of the castle yard were. The sergeant was coming back into view, a tiny figure when seen from this height. Will blinked the moment of vertigo away, and continued to climb, perhaps a little more slowly, and with a little more care than before. There was a hard stopping moment when stretching his right foot to a new foothold, his left boot slipped on the weather-rounded edge of the massive building blocks, and he was left clinging by his hands alone as he desperately scrapped for a foothold. Then he recovered and kept moving. He felt a surge of relief as his hands finally closed over the stone window ledge, and he heaved himself up and into the room, swinging his legs over the sill and dropping lightly inside. The parents' office was deserted, of course. The three-quarter moon streamed light in through the big window, and there... On the desk where the Baron had left it was the single sheet of paper that held the answer to Will's future. Nervously he glanced around the room. The Baron's huge high-backed chair stood like a sentry behind the desk. A few other pieces of furniture loomed dark and motionless on one wall. A portrait of one of the Baron's ancestors glared down at him, accusingly. He shook off these fanciful thoughts and crossed quickly to the desk his soft boots making no noise on the bare boards of the floor. The sheet of paper, bright white with the reflected moonlight, was within reach. Just look at it, read it, and go, he told himself. That was all he had to do. He stretched out a hand for it, his fingers touched it, and a hand shot out of nowhere and seized him by the wrist. Will shouted aloud in fright. His heart leaped into his mouth and he found himself looking up into the cold eyes of Halt the ranger. Where'd he come from? Will had been sure that there had been nobody else in the room, and there had been no sound of a door opening. Then he remembered how the ranger could wrap himself in that strange mottled grey-green cloak of his, and seem to melt into the background, blending with the shadows until he was invisible. Not that it mattered how Halt had done it. The real problem was that he had caught Will, here in the Baron's office, and that meant the end to all Will's hope. Thought you might try something like this, said the ranger in a low voice. Will's heart pounding from the shock of the last few moments said nothing. He hung his head in shame and despair. Do you have anything to say? Hold asked, and Will shook his head, unwilling to look up and meet this dark, penetrating gaze. Hall's next words confirmed Will's worst fears. Well, let's see what the Baron thinks about this, he said. Please, Hald, no, no. Then Will stopped. There was no excuse for what he had done. And the least he could do was face his punishment like a man, like a warrior, like his father, he thought. The ranger studied him for a moment. Will, Will thought he saw a brief flick of recognition. Then the eyes darkened once more. What? Hald said godly. Will shook his head. Nothing. The ranger's grip was like iron around his wrist as he held Will out the door and 
onto the wide curving staircase that led up to the parents' living quarters. The sentries at the head of the stairs looked up in surprise at the sight of the grim-faced ranger and the boy beside him. At a brief signal from Holt, they stood aside and opened the doors onto the baron's apartment. The room was brightly lit, and for a moment Will looked around in confusion. He was sure he had seen the lights go out on this floor while he waited and watched in the tree. Then he saw behind the heavy drips across the window and understood, in contrast to the baron's sparsely furnished working quarters below. This room was a comfortable clutter of settees, footstools, carpets, tapestries, and armchairs. In one of these, Baron Arold sat, reading through a pile of reports. He looked up from the page he was holding as Hall entered with his captive. So you were right, said the Baron, and Hall nodded. Just as I said, my lord, you came across the castle yard like a shadow, dodged the sentry as if he wasn't there, and climbed up the tower wall like a spider. The Baron set the report down on the side table and leaned forward. He climbed the tower, you say? He asked a trifle incredulously. No rope, no ladder, my lord. Climbed it as easily as you get on your horse in the morning. Easier, in fact, Hall said with just the ghost of a smile. The Baron frowned. He was a little overweight, and sometimes he needed help getting on his horse after a late night. He obviously wasn't amused by Hall's reminding him of the fact. Well, now, he said, looking sternly at Will, this is a serious matter. Will said nothing. He wasn't sure if he should agree or disagree. Either cause had it's dangerous. But he wished Hald hadn't put the Baron in a bad mood by referring to his weight. It certainly wouldn't make things any better for him. So what shall we do with you, young Will? The Baron continued. He rose from his chair and began to pace. Will looked up at him, trying to gauge his mood. The strong, bearded face told him nothing. The Baron stopped his pacing and fingered his beard thoughtfully. Tell me, young Will, he said, facing away from the miserable boy. What would you do in my place? What would you do with a boy who broke into your office in the middle of the night and tried to steal an important document? I wasn't stealing, my lord. The denial burst from Will before he couldn't contain it. The Baron turned to him, one eyebrow raised in apparent disbelief. Will continued weakly, I just wanted to see it, that, that's all. Perhaps so, said the Baron, that eyebrow still raised. But you haven't answered my question. What would you do in my place? Will hung his head again. He could plead, he could apologize, he could ask for mercy, he could try to explain. But then he squared his shoulders and came to a decision. He had known the consequences of being caught and he had chosen to take the risk, he had no right now to plead for forgiveness. My lord, he said hesitantly, knowing that this was a decisive moment in his life. The Baron regarded him, still half turned away from the window. Yes, he said, and will somehow find the resolve to go on. My lord, I don't know what I would do in your place. I do know there is no excuse for my actions, and I will accept whatever punishment you decide. As he spoke, he raised his face to look the Baron in the eye, and in doing so, he caught the Baron's quick glance to Hall. There was something in that glance he saw. Strangely, it was almost a look of approval or agreement. Then it was gone. Any suggestions, Hall? The Baron asked in a careful, neutral tone. Will looked at the ranger now. His face was stern, as it always was. The grizzled grey beard and short hair made him seem even more disproving, more ominous. Perhaps we should show him the paper he was so keen to see, my lord, he said, producing the single sheet from inside his sleeve. The Baron allowed a smile to break through. Not a bad idea, he said. I suppose in a way it does spell out his punishment, doesn't it? Will glanced from one man to the other. There was something going on here he didn't understand. The Baron seemed to think that what he had just said was rather amusing. Hold on the other hand wasn't sharing the fun. If you say so, my lord, he replied evenly. The Baron waved a hand at him impatiently. Take a joke, Holt, take a joke. Well, go on, show him the paper. The ranger crossed the room and handed Will the sheet he had risked so much to see. His hand trembled as he took it. His punishment? 
But how had the Baron known he wouldn't deserve punishment before the actual event? He realized that the Baron was watching him expectantly. Hall as ever was an impassive statue. Will unfolded the sheet and read the words Harold had written there. The boy Will has the potential to be trained as a ranger. I will accept him as my apprentice. Chapter 6 Will stared at the words on the paper in utter confusion. His first reaction was one of relief. He wasn't to be condemned to a lifetime of farm work, and he wasn't to be punished for his actions as the burn in the burn study. Then that initial sense of relief gave away to a sudden nagging doubt. He knew nothing about rangers beyond myth and superstition. He knew nothing about Holt, apart from the fact that the grim grey cloaked figure had made him feel nervous whenever he was around. Now it seemed he was being assigned to spend all his time with him, and he wasn't sure that he liked that idea at all. He looked up at the two men. The Baron, couldn't he could see, was smiling expectantly. Apparently he felt that Will should greet his decision as good news. He couldn't see Hall's face clearly. The deep cowl of his cloak left his face in shadow. The Baron's smile faded slightly. He appeared a little puzzled by Will's reaction to the news, or rather... A slag of any reaction. Well, what do you say, Will? He asked in an encouraging tone. Will drew a deep breath. Thank you, sir, my lord, he said uncertainly. What if the baron's earlier joke about the note containing his punishment was more serious than he thought? Maybe being assigned to be Hall's apprentice was the worst punishment he could have chosen. But the baron certainly didn't look as he thought so. He seemed to be very pleased with the idea, and Will knew he wasn't an unkind man. The Baron gave a little sigh of pleasure as he lowered himself onto the armchair. He looked up the ranger and gestured towards the door. Perhaps you might give us a few moments alone, Hall. I'd like to have a word with Will in private, he said. The ranger bowed gravely. Certainly, my lord, he said, the voice coming from deep inside the cowl. He moved silently as ever. Passed Will and out through the door that led to the corridor outside. The door closed behind him with barely a sound, and Will shivered. The man was uncanny. Sit down, Will. The Baron just stood to one of the low armchairs facing his own. Will sat nervously on the edge of it, as if poised for flight. The Baron noticed his body language and sighed. You don't seem very pleased with my decision, he said, sounding disappointed. The reaction puzzled Will. He would have thought a powerful figure like the Baron would care, wouldn't care in any way or other what an insignificant ward would think about his decisions. He didn't know how to answer. They sat in silence until finally the Baron continued. Would you prefer to work as a farmhand? He asked. He couldn't believe that a lively, energetic boy like this could possibly prefer such a dull, uneventful life. But maybe he was wrong. Well, hurriedly reassured him on that score. No, sir, he said hastily. The Baron made a small questioning gesture with his hand. Well, then, would you prefer that I punished you somehow for what you've done? Will started to speak, then realized that his answer might be insulting and stop. The Baron guilted for him to continue. It's just that I'm not sure you haven't, sir, he said. Then noticing the frown that creased the Baron's forehead as he said the words you heard on, I, I, I don't know much about rangers, sir, and p people say... He let the words trail off. It was obvious that the Baron held Hall in some esteem, and Will didn't think it was politic for him to point out that the ordinary people feared rangers as thought they were warlocks. He saw that the Baron was nodding, and a look of understanding had replaced the perplexed expression he had been wearing. Of course, people say they're black magicians, don't they? He agreed. And Will nodded, not even realizing he was doing so. Tell me, Will, do you find Hall to be a frightening person? No, sir, Will hastily. Then as the Baron held his gaze, he reluctantly added, Well, maybe a bit. The Baron leaned back, steepling his fingers together. Now that he understood the reason for the boy's reluctance, he berated himself mentally for not foreseeing them. After all, he had a better knowledge of the ranger corpse than he could expect of a young boy, just turned fifteen, who was subjected to the usual superstitions and mutterings of the castle staff. 
arranges our mysterious group of people, he said. But there's nothing about them to be frightened of, unless you're an enemy of the kingdom. He could see that the boy was hanging on his every word. And he added jokingly, you're not an enemy of the kingdom, are you, Will? No, sir, Will said in sudden fright, and Baron sighed again. He hated when people didn't realize he was joking. Unfortunately, as overlord of the castle, his words were treated with great seriousness by most people. All right, all right, he said reassuringly. I know you're not. But believe me, I thought you'd be glad for this appointment. An adventurous lad like you should take into life as a ranger, like a duck to water. It's a big opportunity for you, Will. He paused, studying the boy closely, seeing that he was still uncertain about the whole matter. Very few boys are chosen to be apprentice rangers, you know. The opportunity only comes up on rare occasions. Will nodded, but he still wasn't totally convinced. He thought he owed it to him his dream to have at least one attended battle school. After all, the Baron did seem to be in an uncommonly good mood this evening, in spite of the fact that Will had broken into his office. I, I wanted to be a warrior, sir, he said tentatively, but the Baron shook his head immediately. I'm afraid your talents lie in other directions. Paul knew that when he first saw you. That's why he asked for you. Oh, said Will. There wasn't much else he could say. He felt he should be reassured by all the Burns had said, and to a certain degree he was. But there was still so much uncertainty to it all, he thought. It's just that Paul seemed to be so grim all the time, he said. He certainly doesn't have my sparkling sense of humor, the Baron agreed. Then as Will looked blankly at him, he muttered something under his breath. Will wasn't sure what he'd done to upset him, so he thought it'd be best to change the subject. But, but what does the ranger actually do, my lord? he asked. Once again, the baron shook his head. That's for Hall to tell you himself. They're a quirky group, and they don't like other people talking about them too much. Now perhaps you should go back to your quarters and try and get some sleep. You're to report to Hall's cottage at six o'clock in the morning. Yes, my lord, Will said, rising from his uncomfortable perch on the edge of the chair. He wasn't sure if he was going to enjoy life as a ranger's apprentice, but it appeared he had no choice in the matter. He bowed to the baron, who nodded briefly in return, then he turned away for the door. The baron who I stopped him? Will? This time used the stairs. Y yes, my lord. He replied seriously and was a little puzzled by the way the Baron rolled his eyes to the sky and muttered something to himself again. This time he could make out a few words. It was something about jokes, he thought. He let himself out through the door. The sentries were still on duty on the landing by the stairs, but Holt was gone. Or at least he appeared to be. But the rangers, you could never quite know for certain.